Good morning. Welcome to Partnership Christian Church. My name is Ryan. Uh, I, thank you so much for joining us. And uh, if this is your first time here, uh, welcome. Welcome to Partnership Christian Church. We are so uh, thankful to have you and happy to have you. Uh, if you could do something for us, that would be great. There is this thing in our bulletin called a connection card. And all the connection card is is a way for us to follow up with you. Uh, so here at Partnership Church, we really want to uh, see you grow deeper in your relationship with Christ. And so that's what the connection card is for. Uh, there's, a, there's some information to fill out, and then there's a prayer request. Uh, that, the prayer request is for anybody. Uh, if, if you have a prayer request, please fill that out. Uh, we want to pray for you. We pray for you four times uh, throughout the week, uh, sanctioned times. Uh, so please fill that out, and uh, you can return it to one of our offering boxes uh, throughout the worship center, uh, or we have a table out in the foyer uh, where if you bring the connection card there, we have a gift to give you as a way to say thank you for uh, joining us. I have a few announcements. Uh, this is a busy month coming up. Uh, so next week is our missions rummage sale, May 1st. It's going to be from 7 to 3.30 we need volunteers to help set up April 30th, that's the day before, and then uh, the day of as well. And if you want to start bringing items, you can start bringing items tomorrow. So we'll, we'll keep them here. Uh, I think there will be a U-Haul truck, and then uh, we'll set all of that up on uh, April 30th. And then the same weekend, April 2nd, we're going to have a partnership family barbecue uh, that's going to be after service, and we need you to bring sides. All the barbecue is going to be provided, but if you could bring sides uh, for everyone to share, that would be great. And then also on May 2nd, we're going to go back to one service. Our service is going to be at 1030. Yeah, that's, that's awesome. Yeah. And then May 21st and 22nd, we're having what, what we're calling Partnership Family Camp. So this is going to be an event where uh, you bring your tents, your enos, and we're actually going to set them up in this field, and we're going to have a big family camp. And uh, we're going to have games and uh, inflatables. Uh, we think we're going to make hot dogs. Uh, so it's going to be a great time. And then also, if you were not here last week to hear about the Pregnancy Resource Center, uh, their ministry is amazing at what they do, and we are still giving away the baby bottles uh, for you to fill up with change or money, and then you can bring those back, and we'll make sure that they get to the Pregnancy Resource Center. Thank you all so much for joining us, and I'll turn it over to the worship team. I hope we don't make hot dogs. I hope we just grill them, because that would be really <laughs> disgusting. <laughs> just saying, brother. All right, listen, I am so thankful that you all are here today. Every one of you has brought something into this room collect individually that collectively is amazing. And part of that, that what you brought into this room is pain and fear. And sometimes it's uncertainty. It's, it's saying, hey, I, I read these words. I believe these words, but I, you know, I, I face this thing right now. I don't know. I don't know about what's going to happen. I know that uh, one of my, my younger son plays college football and I was watching the game. I'm a nervous wreck watching this game. And it was the very first game they ever played and then he got destroyed in the play and he about cost him a game. But I had it recorded and I could go back and I could watch it again and I, I just felt different because I already knew how it was gonna end. I knew that they didn't lose the game because of him. I knew that it ended up being okay as a result of that. Who we are this morning as we gather in here as our unique people, collectively, we are the body of Christ. And I want you to know, if you've not read ahead, how it ends, because it ends good. In fact, I want you to participate in us reading together to do that. I wanna ask if you would to please stand, and we're gonna read these words together that talk about what happens at the end. The, what, all the pain that we've gone through, everything else of this life that you and I will face, this is what happens at the end. Please read together with me. 
praise from the great crowd. After this, I saw a vast crowd, too great to count, from every nation and tribe and people and language standing in front of the throne and before the Lamb. They were clothed in white robes and held palm branches in their hands. And they were shouting with a great roar, salvation comes from our God who sits on the throne and from the Lamb. And all the angels were standing around the throne and around the elders and the four living beings. And they fell before the throne with their faces to the ground and they worshiped God. They sang, amen, blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and strength belong to our God forever and ever, amen. Let's sing together. I raise a hallelujah in the presence of my enemies. I raise a hallelujah louder than the unbelief. Sing it out. I raise a hallelujah. melody I raise a hallelujah heaven comes to fight for me I'm gonna sing in the middle of the storm louder and louder you're gonna hear my praises roar come from the ashes Oh 
together. Father God, you, you love us. That's the truth, because that's who you are. You are love. 
And in your grace, you looked at your creation and you looked at us in our misery and in our sin and in our brokenness and in our selfishness. And you see something that we don't see. You see what we will be. Not out of our power, not of our might or intellect, but because of you, because of your spirit who is alive and within us. Father, you are our father. And so whether we have a good earthly father, whether we have good relationships and when it comes to the family or those kind of roles, God, you are our father and we are your children. And as your children today, we just want to sing and to worship and to pray and to remember through the Lord's Supper and to hear from you, to hear your words spoken. And then we want to put them into practice because that's how we love you, as we obey. We grow as followers of you. God, be pleased with our hearts this day. Calm our hearts. May your peace transcend in this place and in our lives. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. I've heard a thousand stories of what they think you're like, but I've heard tender whisper of love in the dead of night. Tell me that you're pleased and that I'm never alone.
You're a good, good father. It's who you are. It's who you are. It's who you are. And I'm loved by you. It's who I am. It's who I am. It's who I am. Please be seated. Thank you. A story was shared about a bridge operator who had a son whom he dearly loved. In fact, they were inseparable. The son would often go to his work uh, with the dad, and, and the dad was responsible for raising and lowering the drawbridge, allowing boats to pass underneath and passenger trains to cross above. On one particular day, the son wandered off from the river's edge, unbeknownst to his dad, and he began to climb on the gears of the drawbridge. His foot slipped and he got stuck in the crack of those gears. And at the same time, he could hear in the distance the sound of a passenger train heading to the bridge. His dad heard it too. And so he looked to find his son. He could see his son nowhere, and he cried out for his son. And, and his son responded and said, Dad, I'm stuck. I can't get loose. I can't get my foot out. The father was horrified. In an instant, he was faced with an unimaginable dilemma. He could race down hundreds of steps and rescue his son at the cost of the lives on the people in the train, or he could sacrifice his son and save the lives of the people on that train. So with tears in his eyes streaming, his hands shaking, he made the choice. He pulled the lever and lowered the drawbridge, crushing his only son. With tears in his eyes, uncontrollably, he rushed down to the platform as the train was passing. And most of the passengers on that train simply looked away. Uh, they saw the man on the platform, and that was just about it. But others took a brief glance, as if nothing significant happened. You see, they had passed by that bridge hundreds and hundreds of times. It was just a routine crossing. Do you see the parallel? Can you understand the picture that this story paints? The sacrifice of one gives life to all. God could not enjoy seeing his son die. It must have been agonizing. 
to watch his son die, his only begotten son die, such a horrifying death. As Jesus took the sins of the world, our sins, our grief, our pain, our guilt, our shame upon him on the cross. For God so loved the world that he gave his son. That's why Jesus came to this earth. As Joseph said, or the, the angel said to Joseph, you are to give him the name Jesus for he will save his people from their sins. And indeed he did. Make no mistake, Jesus' death was not an accident. He willingly laid down his life to give us life. Like the people on that train, we have a choice as to how we will deal with his sacrifice. We can choose a passing glance and then continue on our lives as if nothing has changed. Or we can look intently into the, his sacrifice and allow it to change and transform our hearts and our lives that we become fully devoted followers of Jesus Christ. Where on that train are you this morning? Is it a routine passing glance? Or is it something much, much more? This bread represents the body of Jesus Christ who was crushed for our iniquities, our sins, to give us life. As we take this, we remember that sacrifice. This grape juice signifies, it symbolizes his shed blood. As the scripture says, without the shedding of blood, there cannot be forgiveness of sins. His blood was shed so that we could live. As we drink this, we remember his sacrifice. Let's pray. Father God, we just, words can't describe. How precious you are. You are a good, good father. In giving your son. So that we could have life. To love us, father, while we were yet sinners. And to continue to provide mercy upon our souls. Father, we know that we're not worthy. And yet you still love us. And you still continue to guide us. And father, I just pray that. In response, our gratitude would be love and to follow you and to follow your son to the best of our abilities. Thank you again, Father, for your great love for us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you for that, John. Good morning. Welcome again to partnership and we're glad that you've uh, you've joined us this morning to worship and we hope that you I'm going to scoot that right there for a moment hope you feel at home and and welcomed as well um, this morning we are going to be continuing along in our uh, sermon series called DNA and DNA basically for the sake of this series is about our our DNA as a church and what it is that we are all about. I'm going to take a really quick second to say that, again, in your bulletin, um, it, there's an insert in there, and it looks like this on the front, and on the back, it looks just like a blank sheet of paper. But that's a bit intentional, actually. Um, with the title of the message and the scripture reference for today, that gives you a kind of a note-taking sheet, if you would like. So, um, Anything that inspires you this morning, if you leave it blank, then I'm going to feel like you're uninspired and not need to work on my messages a little bit. So, um, but if you, uh, if you so desire to write any notes down for yourself later on this week uh, to reflect on, then that's the place to do it. As well, uh, as mentioned earlier, the connection card that's also attached to your bulletin. And in that connection card specifically is a question, a question from the pastor. Um, and this particular question really does help me to kind of uh, work things into my message and kind of gauge where everyone is in their 
their journey with the Lord. It's, um, it's a bit um, discerning this week's question. If you'll read it, it says, if you were to be real, if you were to be honest and genuine, how much time do you spend reading or studying the Bible? Now, you don't necessarily have to put your name on that, but I know that if you do, then I will be praying for you and, um, and the amount of time that you spend reading Scripture. Uh, but regardless, that's a way that, that we can connect with you as well. Um, if you would like, you're more than, more than welcome to put your uh, contact details on the connection card, any prayer requests that you may have, and drop them in the boxes in the back, uh, as well as that's a place where we also worship the Lord by giving our, our offerings and our tithes. And we consider that an act of worship, that we, uh, we give back to the Lord. We recognize that He has blessed us with everything. He, it's all His anyway. Uh, he's just giving us opportunity to give back to him what's already his. So however the Lord puts that on your heart, that's a place that you can do that this morning. Let me pray for us before we begin. Father, we give you thanks for such a beautiful day, a day that, that you have made, Lord, and, and, um, and allowed us the opportunity to come together as a body of Christ. To come together, Lord, in song and in prayer, in reading scripture in relationship, in fellowship with one another. All, Lord, to bring honor to you, to, to, um, to lift up the name of your son, Jesus Christ. And I pray, Lord, that what we glean this morning from this message and everything that's happened this morning, I pray, that God, that you are preparing and have prepared our hearts as a receptive spirit, Lord, to be transformed through your word. In Jesus Christ, I pray. Amen. So as I mentioned this morning, we're going to continue on through the, um, through the message series DNA. And we've, we started with our vision, which our vision, which was, you guys remember what it was? Real people with a real hope. That's right. That's who we are. And then it's a why we are. That's our mission. Why are we here? What is our purpose? Our mission, which was? There we go. Love God, love people. Eric, you guys are catching on. It'll, it, it'll get there. You'll get there. Um, just for future reference, we're going to put it up on the wall at some point. So if you ever get the, uh, to the point where you can't remember, you can just look back there and you're like, oh yeah, I'm supposed to love God, love people, and serve both. T- today, we're going to begin through working through our values. So our values is kind of like the bits and pieces that, that make up who we are, our, the things that we value as part of partnership Christian church the number one there's five of those the number one uh, value that we have is at the top is this is that we honor the lordship of Jesus Christ we honor the lordship of Jesus Christ that is our number one value and and to be honest uh, uh, this was one that I was kind of hoping that would have been uh, probably that I think that this this particular one could have incorporated everything could have incorporated our vision our mission and our values Um, and if anybody was in that meeting where we were having as a group um, I was a bit outspoken on that maybe a little bit passionate but we'll we'll let bygones be bygones Um, honor the lordship of Jesus Christ and the reason is the reason why I was so passionate about this because I recognize that everything if you really look at the the um, the intricate details of everything that we do Everything that we believe, everything that, um, that we are, can be boiled down to, do we or do we not honor the Lordship of Jesus Christ, both in our lives, personally, and as a church? And that's whenever we, we, we recognize Lordship, that word, Lord, just means owner. So when we think about a landlord, he's the owner of the house. Think about Jesus as Lord, he's the owner, he's the master. So do we recognize, do we honor the, the, uh, the ownership of us by Jesus Christ? Do we honor the ownership of the church to Jesus Christ? And when we do, we recognize that we can place everything then under his, under his mastery, under his guidance. We become a, a subservient to him in everything. I want to read from you this morning from Romans chapter 1. And we're going to explore two different aspects of of honoring the Lordship of Jesus Christ. And one of those is personally. 
Personally, we're going to look at how we or what we are expected in honoring the lordship of Jesus Christ in our personal relationship, in our personal life. And, and Paul says this, and he just opens up the book of Romans like this. Paul, and he's actually he's, he's, uh, addressing the Romans as this is his, um, his opening to the book. Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called as an apostle and set apart for the gospel of God which he promised beforehand through his prophets and the Holy Scriptures concerning his Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Now, just a bit sidebar. If you ever are looking for the most concise portion of what is the gospel message, what is the gospel message, what is the good news of Jesus Christ, that's it, in that first two verses. Jesus Christ is the Son of God, and he is Christ our Lord. So Jesus Christ, the Son of God, Christ our Lord. And he continues on in verse 3, who was the descendant of David according to the flesh, and he was appointed to be the powerful Son of God according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection of the dead. Again, we just celebrated Resurrection Sunday. This is what, what empowered Jesus, what set him apart as Lord of all. Firstborn from the grave, he is the one that was, was announced worthy of, because he had defeated death, our one true enemy. Verse 5, through him we have received grace and apostleship to bring about obedience of faith for the sake of his name among all the Gentiles, including you who are also called by Jesus Christ. Now there's, uh, there's just so much richness, richness packed into this one little section, one little introduction to the book of Romans. And if we were to take it and we would break it down just a little bit, we recognize that Paul himself recognizes, recognizes himself as a called out one, as a servant, very first, very first line, a servant of Jesus Christ. And he also calls Jesus Christ his Lord. So he kind of does that, that dichotomy there. He says, I'm a servant, Jesus Christ is my Lord. He's the one that I serve. At the same time, he calls himself an apostle. Now, this apostle with a lowercase p merely means a sent one, one who is sent. So, so Paul considers himself that he's not only a servant of Jesus Christ, who is his Lord, but he's also one who's been sent out by him to share that same message. And that's what we recognize on ourselves as servants of Jesus Christ with him as our Lord. We are servants of him and yet we are also sent out. We are called to be sent out with that same message, with that same uh, gospel, uh, the, the beauty of the gospel, the power of the gospel, to go and share that and to live it out uh, to those around us. Then as he continues on and he explains that Jesus Christ is our Lord, he, he, gave, his, he gave evidence of him being both man, 100% man in the flesh, and then also 100% God as that he was called out uh, and he was um, appointed to be the powerful son of God according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection. He states something very specific in verse 5. He says, through him we have received grace and we have received apostleship. So we have received a sentness, and we have received grace. Now this grace aspect of the lordship of Jesus is something that we overlook a lot of times. And that means that Jesus, if he is lord of our lives, he is the master over every aspect of it. Our actions, our thoughts our emotions, but he's also Lord over the things that we'd prefer not to talk about. Our struggles, our sins, our frustrations, our hurt, our anger, our pain, our illness. We have to recognize that if he is going to be Lord of all, if he's going to be completely over us, we have to allow him to take complete reign over the whole kit and caboodle. Does that make sense? There's this old saying that goes, either Jesus is Lord of all, or he is not Lord at all. And let me explain 
in a little bit of an illustration what I'm talking about. A few weeks ago, and uh, this is the first time, I get to do a lot of first times with you. This is the first time I've ever brought a shredder to, um, to the message. In fact, uh, I, I told Randy, or for, for anybody that's, sca- that's a skateboarder, that I'm, that I'm shredding on stage, okay? He's gonna, he'd really appreciate me shredding on stage. So a couple of weeks ago, you guys might remember that in the connection card, the pastor's question was, if you were to be real, what's something that you struggle with? What's a pain that you have? What's something that you struggle to give up to the Lord? And this is what it looks like to actually do that, is to take those, and these are the ones. I've saved them because I've been praying about these. This is what it means to give it to the Lord. This is what it means, every single one of them. It's like, I'm not going to worry about that anymore because that's now God's. Jesus Christ, my Lord, he's now taken that. And not only am I going to give it to him, but I've got to leave it with him. Because here's where, the, here's where the trouble is. A lot of times we're like, okay, I prayed about that. I give it to, okay, giving it to, all right, maybe I can, I'm going to. I'm gonna. And here we are, we try to put that thing back together so we can worry about it a little bit more. So that we can pray about it again. And, and Satan is telling us that we need to put this thing about together again because did Jesus really forgive you? I don't know, maybe I need to pray about that. Maybe I need to ask forgiveness a second time or a third time or a fourth time. See, when Jesus is Lord of all, he's Lord of all. All, one time, full, complete. And we can live a worry-free, anxiety-free life whenever we submit these things to Jesus Christ our Lord and we leave them with him. That is the grace that Paul talks about on this personal relationship With Jesus Christ, the Son of God, our Lord. And grace is simply this. Grace is simply getting something, receiving something that we don't deserve. Imagine like this. We, each one of us, are familiar with um, with bills, with getting a, a bill, a water bill, a, a gas bill, uh, you know, you name it. I, I, we just uh, uh, signed on a house, so I'm getting to enjoy all those things that you guys get to enjoy with all kinds of bills. Um, now, the one thing that we often have whenever we receive, receive those bills is we see, we see at the bottom of it, it says, this is your due date. This is when this $200 bill is due, all right? And then it'll say under in little small letters to say, but you have until whatever, two weeks later to pay it before it's late. You ever notice that? So the due date is actually when the bill's due. The extra couple of weeks, that's called a, a grace period. The grace period is not something that you deserve. The bill's due on the date that it says. The grace period is something that they give you because you don't deserve it. They're just out of the kindness and the love of their heart, they're going to give that to you. Grace is like that from Jesus Christ our Lord. He gives it to us, and we don't deserve it. We can't deserve it. We can't earn it. But in order to receive it, we have to place ourselves under his lordship. We have to give it to him, and we have to leave it with him. Quit taking it back. There's no taking it back. No take backs. That's the lordship of Jesus Christ on a personal, personal level. Now we're going to speak of the lordship of Jesus Christ on the level of the church. Paul also says in Ephesians, he says that God exercised his power in Christ by raising him from the dead and seating him at the right hand of the heavens. Far above every other ruler and authority, power and dominion, a title given not only in this age, but also in the one to come. And he subjected, he subjected everything under his feet and appointed him as head over everything for the church, 
which is his body, the fullness of the one who fills all things in every way. You see, in the same way that we are expected to place ourselves under the authority of Jesus Christ and his lordship, fully, completely holy, W-H-O-L-L-Y, holy, at the same time we are called to submit the church to the lordship of Jesus Christ. Sometimes you'll hear me say that Jesus is our pastor, is our capital P pastor. If at all possible, I prefer to use a lowercase p pastor for my title, if I have to use a title at all. And that's because Jesus is our pastor. Jesus is our Lord. He's the Lord of the church. Jesus is the one that God has set apart to be, have power and dominion over his body, which is called the church. And over and over again, we have seen in this day and age where Jesus has been put on the sidelines and a leader or a group of leaders within a church have taken the church completely off the rails into some random place to where it doesn't look like Jesus' body at all. It's not following his his uh, teachings, it's not following his lead on prayer, it's not following his lead on valuing scripture, it's not following his lead on honoring the Father, it's not following his lead on being on mission. It's because in a lot of times, in a lot of ways, we say, hey Jesus, thank you for getting us started here with the church, but we've got it from here. And there's huge, huge danger in that. Let me give you an example of what it is like whenever we don't allow and give Jesus the the authority and the guidance that he has been set apart for in the church. Now this one might be a little more closer to home. Anybody know what this is? Oh yeah, oh yeah. If you're a car guy or gal, you probably know what this is. This is a 1966... Cobra, uh, excuse me, 1966 Cobra Super Snake. 1966 Shelby Cobra Super Snake. All right? There were two of these cars built, just two. Now, Carol Shelby built two of these cars in 1966. It was a, um, a dual, a, a twin turbo, 427, for any of you guys that like techie stuff, 800 horsepower. In this car. Imagine 800 horsepower in a car that's the size of a Mazda Miata. Okay? This thing was wicked and wicked fast. Carroll Shelby made two of them. One of them he made for himself. And the one that he made for himself was his daily driver. He drove it to the office every day, he drove it to the restaurant, he drove it home. It was his car he made it for himself the second one that he made he gave to his good friend comedian Bill Cosby whenever he gave that car with that much power to Bill Cosby back in 1960 I think it was 67 Bill Cosby cranked it up he took it for one drive one around the block brought it back to Carroll Shelby handed him the keys and he said no thank you It had so much power that it scared it scared him to death. And he would not have any part of it. So Carol was like, well, what do I do with this car now that I've got two of them? Well, he ended up selling the second uh, Super Snake to a dealership in San Francisco who then in turn sold it to a man named Tom Maxey. What does Tom Maxey do? He loses control of it and drives it off a cliff in California into the Pacific Ocean. What's my point? The point is, all that power, all of that ingenuity, all of that perfection can really only be harnessed and driven by the one who created it and for the reason that it was created. See, Carol Shelby was able to to harness that. He was able to control it. He was able to use it for the purpose in which he built it. And he was able to use it every single day. 
his daily driver. In the hands of anybody else, it was a death trap. And I mean that literally because the second man that drove it off into the Pacific Ocean, he died. Folks, we have to recognize that Jesus Christ, set apart by God the Father, is the pilot of this vessel we call the church, his body. And that's why everything, that's why I was so passionate about this whenever we developed the vision, missions, and values. Because everything that we do, everything that we are, everything that we, that we claim to be has to fall under the lordship of Jesus Christ. He is the owner. He is set apart with the power and the authority in which to do it and to do it effectively according to the kingdom of God, according to honoring God the Father and his purposes set apart in heaven. You see, when we, when we do that, when we make Jesus Christ the Lord of the church, then we are naturally real people with a real hope. That's because Jesus knows our innermost, um, our innermost spirit, our innermost heart. He knows us. He knows how we should be real and open and genuine with him, but also have that real hope. He knows that um, whenever he spoke about loving God and loving people and serving them both, that if we fall under his lordship, then we'll do that naturally because we want to be obedient to what he told us to do. And we recognize that even the other values that we have fall under this as well. That we're going to submit to biblical authority, which we're going to talk about next week. Because Jesus Christ submitted to the biblical authority. He knew scriptures backwards and forwards. He was able to use the scriptures of the Old Testament, even in a lot of his rebukes and teachings of the people there in his time. We know that we'll also practice intergenerational discipleship you're like i don't remember seeing intergenerational in the bible well do you remember that jesus's disciples were were grown men do you also remember whenever he said don't let the children uh be hindered in coming to me i'm pretty sure that he loved all ages all types and therefore we should value that as well we worship in spirit and in truth jesus christ was spirit he was the perfect epitome of truth, truth of God the Father. That's why we look to him on how we worship. We look to him on how we pray. How often he prayed. In what, in what manner did he pray? What was, his, what was his attitude in prayer? And what was his posture in prayer as well? Everything as a church, Jesus Christ as our capital P pastor, as the pilot of this vessel called his body, the church, has to fall under his lordship. And therefore, it almost makes it perfect that he's kind of center in the vision, mission, and values. Because just as the Old Testament points forward to Jesus and the New Testament points backward to Jesus, I feel like the vision and the mission, they point forward to Jesus as being our Lord and everything else underneath the values also point backwards to Jesus being our Lord. It's absolutely pivotal that we recognize this in our lives and as a church as well. How about you? Is this something that, that you have done personally? Have you placed yourself under his lordship? Have you placed yourself under his guidance, under being a servant of the one true God through the lordship of Jesus Christ? Whenever you want to know how to pray, are you looking at Jesus on how he did it? Whenever you want to know how to, um, how to worship, are you looking at Jesus and, and seeing how he did it? You know, there's a couple of, um, of dear people today that are going to express that very thing on um, testifying to the Lordship of Jesus Christ in their life. We have a mom and a daughter who are going to be baptized today that are making Jesus Christ their Lord and accepting the power of the resurrection of Jesus Christ in their life. 
if you're able to come back here at 3.30, I'm sure that it would be fantastic for them to um, have you here and, and witnessing that and celebrating that. But that's what it looks like. It's that submission of ourselves, of our lowering ourselves and raising up Jesus Christ over us. Setting aside all this stuff, putting it at his feet, and allowing him to keep it. Because he's Lord over us. He's Lord over the church. Let's pray. Father, you have, um, you have given us an immeasurable gift in your son, Jesus Christ. You have, Lord, placed over us not just any Lord, not just any master, but one that is full of love and grace. Lord, you've called each one of us out to be sent ones with the same grace, with the same love, to share it with others. I pray, Lord, that this morning as we as we take this time, Lord, to reflect, to reflect on your word, to reflect on what it means to have Jesus Christ as Lord in our life and Lord of our church. God, I pray that if there's a, if there's a stirring in our hearts, there's a stirring in our spirit, Lord, to, have, to grow deeper in our relationship with you or even just make that initial commitment to you. Lord, I pray that we do that today. And if there's ever been a misunderstanding or, a, um, or just a cloudy understanding of what it is to have Jesus as our Lord, Lord, I pray that that's been clarified today. Lord, I take, pray that we take this time, that we offer up our praise to you and our honor to our Lord Jesus Christ. The Son of God, our Messiah, our Savior. It's in His name I pray. Amen. Let's stand together. If you need to respond, please come forward. If you want somebody to pray for you, just come forward and talk to somebody. Now, if there's nothing magical about the front of this building, but there is something about Jesus, and He invites you to unload those burdens to make him your savior and to talk to him. So let's sing to that. Lord, I come and I confess bowing here I find my rest without you I fall apart you're the one guides my heart. Lord, I need you. Oh, I need you. And every hour, I need you. My one defense, my righteousness. Oh, God, how I runs deep, your grace is more, where grace is found, is where you are, where you are, I am free, holiness is Christ in me. is Christ in me. Lord, I need you. Oh, I need you. Every hour I need you. My one defense, my righteousness. Oh, God, my song to rise to you 
when temptation comes my way when I cannot stand I'll fall on you and Jesus you're my hope and stay and when I cannot stand I'll fall on you and Jesus you're my hope and stay Lord I need you oh I Father God, may you be pleased this day as your children acknowledge you as the Lord, as your church, your bride, the bride of your son, Jesus Christ, our Savior. Father, my prayer now is that as we depart, we are the church that is like Christ, that we to our neighbors, to the people we work with, to the people that we come in contact with, that that hope that's within us will just come out. It will be evident in what we do. Father, may you be pleased. As our worship does not end now, it just continues. Father, we love you in Christ's name. Amen. Have a blessed day.